My name is Robert M. Wood, and I go by Dr. Bob these days. I have a degree in aeronautical engineering from the University of Colorado, and then I subsequently got a PhD in physics from Cornell. And I went right into McDonnell Douglas as a young engineer and stayed with McDonnell Douglas for 43 years, uh, graduating basically through the various management steps and wound up in charge of uh, various aspects of our research and development programs, including the last one was the space station program. So that's my background. During my career at McDonnell Douglas in the late 60s, there was quite a bit of publicly exposed information about the various possible UFO events. One day when I was just doing my normal job supporting my boss, he said, you know, General Schriever is retiring. And now General Schriever was the guy who invented the ICBM. And the Air Force wanted to have a sort of a testimonial event symposium for him. And each of the contractors, including us, got an assignment to predict what the future would hold in the next 10 years. And so our assignment was to talk about going to space and back. And so I knew my boss was really oriented towards nuclear propulsion. And if I didn't tell him otherwise, he was going to talk about nuclear propulsion. Everybody was tired of hearing about nuclear propulsion. So I said, well, gee, Ray, why don't you tell him about how the UFOs allegedly do it? And he said, that's a great idea. Why don't you work that out? So I read my first book, which was Donald Menzel's book. And after I read that book, I told my wife, I said, this guy's a, allegedly a scientist, but he's not talking logically. He's ignoring the data. And so I read another book, and pretty soon I'd read, oh, 50 books. And at that time, I became interested in subscribing to the various journals and met Jim McDonald. Now, there were two interesting aspects that fell out of this meeting with Jim McDonald. One of them was that he kind of convinced me that I had a story that I could tell to my management. Since, since I'd concluded that the UFOs were real, one, one day when I was driving to work, I said, wow, there's no other solution. They're clearly real, they're clearly extraterrestrial, and they work somehow. And I think we ought to figure out how they work, because I wouldn't want to be the last aerospace company to discover gravity control. I think we ought to be the first. So I took a briefing to my management, and my management was very sympathetic at that particular time for, for some new creative ideas. They didn't have much of a basic research program, and I offered a, a very modest project to look into this problem. So we did some things like seeing whether we could change the speed of light by a, a large axial magnetic field. And we hired Stan Friedman, actually, to use the UFO literature as a basis for clues as to what technology might be involved. So that was, that was this project was underway. And Jim McDonald became aware of the fact that there was a symposium about to happen in Boston that uh, Philip Morrison and Carl Sagan were organizing on UFOs. So he apparently planted the seed in Sagan's ear and said, you know, there's a group at McDonnell Douglas who's studying UFOs. You might want to give them a call and see if they want to participate. Well, I had just finished reading Carl Sagan's wonderful book, Intelligent Life in the Universe, written in about 1966, and had a tremendous respect for the ideas that I had seen there, which included the serious consideration for extraterrestrial life. And so Carl called one day and introduced himself, and I was honored, of course, because you know he was clearly more outranking than I was uh, in terms of his profession at that time. <clears throat> and and uh, he, he said, I understand that you might be doing some work, and what would you want to talk about if we were asked to give a paper? And I said, well, Carl, one thing I wouldn't want to do is what everybody else is probably going to do, and they would try to prove that they're real. I said, it's very clear to anybody who studies it at all that they're extraterrestrial. And the more, most important thing is to figure out how they work. So I would give a paper discussing the different avenues that one could explore in order to figure out how they work. And there was long silence on the phone, <laughs> and he never invited me to give the paper. So at, at that, I did, however, attend the conference anyway. And, uh, I heard everybody else who, who was there and I realized that at that time I began to ask myself, is there some plan to control this process? That was just a sort of a subconscious thought that I had in my mind and I didn't really do much with, more with it then. So that's two stories. 
that relate to my career. Now there was, there is a third story relating to my career, <clears throat> which is much more subtle. It had to do with classified work. The classified program that I was working on was uh, at, the, at the code word level. And in it actually it had, had very simply to do with, uh, since I was working on our uh, ballistic missile defense program, it's very common for uh, intelligence agencies like the CIA to ask contractors who have an expertise in one area to study the enemy's expertise in that same area. And so this program was to study the Soviet ballistic missile defense program. And, and that fact, I think, is actually unclassified. Now, the name of the program might be classified in association with it. But <clears throat> so as I became familiar with the, the, the program, it was pretty interesting. As you may know, when you get cleared for one of these classified programs, you wear your special badge. and. You know, you can talk to anybody who's in the room with a lot of candor and it feels like there's one psychological group and um, there's a lot of camaraderie that builds up. But um, one of, th and they have access to special libraries. So one of the things that we could do was to go up to the library at, uh, that the Air Force ran and sort of paw through top secret material. So since I was interested in UFOs, I had some usual business to take care of, and I'd also kind of look in their library to see what they had on that subject. And for, for about a year, I was getting quite a few hits on the subject about various reports. And then all of a sudden, the whole subject material vanished. It is the entire classification, numerical classification for the subject, and it just vanished. And the, the librarian in our group that I was working with said, you know, he'd been in this business for 20 years. And he, he was, he, he, you know, he's about 40 years old, but he'd been in that vault for 20 years and knew exactly how things normally were done. And he said, this is remarkable. He said, I've never seen that before. <laughs> you just don't have a whole subject vanish out from under. He said, I think there is something there that you, you hit on. He said, uh, you know, you ought to go see the Condon Committee and tell them what you're doing. You say, you've got some, some good stuff and, and you've got a good plan. And, and so I, I did. I wrote him a nice little letter and saying that our, our company had been looking into the subject of UFOs and did they want to hear what we were doing. And so I got a courteous invitation back from, uh, from Condon. And we prepared a little briefing that explained how, explained how you could take a toroidal loop of superconducting material and establish a strong magnetic field in one direction and, and then charge it at the same time so it could float in the electrostatic field of the Earth. And the bottom line that I had was that we were just about a factor of 10 away from having superconducting uh, current capacity uh, enough to do this. Now, of course, our team thought, well, gee, only a factor of 10, we're going to be there in a couple of years. The Condon's lack of interest in, in the subject, and in quite in the contrast to his group, his, he called all his group together, who sat around and listened to our briefing. And, uh, and then when he said, well, therefore, you can't do it, they all looked at him in amazement and said, well, but it's only a factor of 10. You know? <laughs> And so I became friendly with several of them, Roy Craig and uh, a couple of the others, and uh, I concluded that this was not an objective study. So I uh, wrote a letter to Condon uh, suggesting that it might be helpful if he would establish his group in two parts and have one of believers and one of disbelievers and let both of them go to work with their angles. and said. I'm taking the liberty of sending this, a copy of this letter to every member of your group whose addresses I had re received from them privately. And he was so furious at that that he called up James S. McDonald, who was at that time the, the chairman of the newly merged Douglas and McDonald aircraft companies, and tried to get me fired. Really. I found this out three years later from my boss, uh, who Apparently, number one reported that McDonald said, I don't like other people meddling in my business. So that was nice to hear from the CEO. And, and he asked the, you know, the usual question, well, what did he do? And the answer is he wrote a letter. 
and he wrote a letter that had been approved through my management because that, that's what I did. And, uh, and so my management backed me up, he backed me up, and, and I didn't ever learn of this <laughs> until about three years later, that I, my career was, you know, practically uh, gone. So the head of the Air Force Condon Committee tried to get you fired. Condon, just, Condon, personally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right, personally. Tried to get you fired. Right. In the meantime, there was one other thing that came about as a result of my association with Jim McDonald, and, and that was uh, we had become quite, quite friendly. I liked the guy. He was really an energetic physicist and, and wouldn't let any grass grow under his feet. Uh, when, he, when he got a case, he would dig his teeth into it and present an overwhelmingly convincing story to professional societies. And he would talk to the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and the American Physical Society, and I happen to be members of both. So whenever he was in town, I would pick him up, escort him, make sure that he felt welcome. And so once when I was traveling through Tucson, where he lived, I stopped. I had a, like a two-hour layover and to catch an airplane. He came out to the airport to have a beer with me. And uh, so I said, well, you know, what, what's, what's new, Jim? And he said, well, he says, I think I've got it. And I said, what, what do you think you got? He said, I think I, I got the answer. And I said, well, what is it? He said, I can't tell you yet. I got to be sure. And it was six weeks after that that he tried to shoot himself. And, uh, you know, a couple months after that that he finally, finally died. Knowing what I think I now suspect about the skills of our counterintelligence people, I think we had the capacity to convince him to do it himself. And I think that's what happened. Well, one of the things that one does in beginning to study the subject of UFOs is to answer the obvious questions of, where do they come from? Is it all real? And if that's true, how do they work? What's the evidence? And so one of the things that I did kind of early on was to uh, take the data that we got from reading the literature that Stan Friedman was kind of collecting and, and take specific cases to see what clues were there. For example, the case of the Paul Hill sighting where there were two UFOs circling around each other at a known distance apart and under a known cloud cover told you that there was 135 Gs of acceleration. So they had, you know, really a good number. And then likewise, you can compute the Gs from the time to disappear over the horizon. So I developed a, a kind of a technical briefing on, on what we knew the limits might be. And, and also things relating to the physical evidence that is uh, <coughs> indentations on a railroad tie that were so deep and to, so big a diameter to you, you know, what the pressure was going to be per square centimeter. And you can make an estimate of what that meant with respect to the, the weight of the, of the craft. So these kinds of things I just kind of automatically did as I was de developing my thought processes. And I concluded that there was just no question about what they were, they were genuine, real objects, and that they worked in some specific way. And that the only question was to figure out how. That is, there, there, were not, there was nothing like magic, and there are no secrets if you're smart enough. You just figure out what the equations are. And we weren't there yet. We, we, we studied this project on company money, and wound up we spent $500,000 of 1968 to $70 um, of the company's money. Here we were studying a technology that might be a thousand years ahead of ours, and we might not have the materials or the, or the methods or anything. So the right thing to do was to, to cancel it. Were, there were other things as I became more familiar with the literature that I gradually developed an opinion on. Uh, one was the opinion that the psychic communication was always a clue and was usually present. As I remember the one case that particularly impressed me of some guy in Mexico said he came around, he was hiking, he came around a corner and there was this huge alien with a, a device around his belt. And so the guy touched the belt, turned the knob and all of a sudden he was hearing what the alien was thinking. Directly. Just like that. And I said, well, you know, that's what we need is a device like that. All you have to do is figure out how it works. And it should be straightforward once we study that. That's why when, when, when I was in the vault, I was working with a guy who turned out, you may even have heard of him, uh, his name is Jack Houck, um, who had a good deal of interest in studying anomalous things that had to do with the mind. 
And so he had been looking at the subject of remote viewing. He invented the PK party with Colonel John Alexander, and whom you may know, well, whom people may know of. And uh, Jack got me interested in uh, doing, becoming familiar with, with remote viewing. And so I met Hal Putoff when he was working at SRI. And Hal told me about their program there. And, and one thing led to another that we did a little uh, coordinate remote viewing program of our own. And it turned out that Mr. McDonnell became aware of this fact that we were doing this in, in the vault. Uh, or at least we were thinking about doing it. And he called me into his office one day when I was back at St. Louis on a business trip. And I thought, you know, I'm about to, <laughs> about to get really chastised. But he talked to me for two hours and said he was excited to find out there was somebody who was interested in the subject because, you know, he, he named his airplanes the Phantom and the Voodoo because he believed in that stuff. Uh, and the Banshee, I think. There were maybe four names. And so he gave us $20,000 to study this coordinate rem remote viewing covertly in the vault. The net result was that I had become familiar with yet another corner of anomalies, namely the, the psychic end. And so I just actually, I started to in, inadvertently just add together what I knew about UFOs and what I knew about psychic stuff and figure they were all interconnected. And if you get one set of equations, you're going to get the other. And, and Hal Putoff and I were in agreement with that and we'd established a um, pretty good relationship because I was doing some innovative things that Hal hadn't thought of. I came to the conclusion early on that the evidence for extraterrestrial visitation was just overwhelming. I mean, almost so large that you don't even have to discuss it. As I became more familiar with the UFO program and projects, especially in my conversations with Jim McDonald, I originally kind of thought like he did, that it either had to be a cover-up or a follow-up. And he had leaned strongly to follow up, and there was certainly enough evidence to support a lot of follow up by the Blue Book personnel. However, in my last conversation with him, as I thought back on it, I concluded that what he'd found was that he'd found that there was a cover up, and that he very likely had run into the crash, the crash retrieval story. And that's why he wanted to make absolutely sure that it was right before he even told me. So uh, since then, I have not closed my mind to any possibility, including the degree to which we might have been successful in reverse engineering or reverse sciencing the, uh, the, the craft, the possibility that uh, we've been doing that same process in the psychic domain, and the possibility that our intelligence and counterintelligence forces are sufficiently sophisticated that there's almost nothing they can't deal with. I mean, you can imagine, and this comes now from my kind of current work, that as you look at the majestic documents, the ones that we're, we're researching, that the 1952 documents basically say that the most critical problem is the control of the press. You can imagine a group of guys, say in about 1949, getting together and say, how are we going to keep the public from knowing this? And it would have been a challenge. It would have been a fun project to develop the plan to ensure that the public never really found out the truth and to have all sorts of countermeasures ready for if this happens that, if that happens this. And so, in my opinion, whoever is in control now has all these countermeasures all worked out. And guys like me going around giving talks here and there, really no, no problem for them because they've already assumed that that's going to happen. They've assumed that some of the people are going to leak documents. They've assumed that some of these are going to be shown to be unambiguously genuine. But they've also said, well, they put out their small forces and say, well, try to screw it up as much as possible in the meantime. So some of the critics that I have, I think, may be inadvertent pawns of the, the, the guys who are trying to keep it secret. Clearly, in order to have effective control of this subject, you have to control it at all levels, and, and the most obvious level is the media. So you have to look at all the kinds of media there are, the, the movies, the magazines, and of course in the early days, that's all they had is newspapers and movies and magazines. Now we have the internet and, and other, and video and all, all, all those other sorts of things. So, but as the technology has blossomed into these other avenues, the people worrying about this control have also just moved into those avenues right along with them. So every time 
New Avenue comes up, they have a new counterpart. If you look at the documents that we have recovered, it's interesting that some of them discuss the reasons why one would want to keep this secret. And some of those reasons were extremely valid at the time. For example, the first documents that we now have, in fact, they just came a few weeks ago, was, was one having to do with the Los Angeles air raid. And from that air raid, apparently, there were two crashes, one that was recovered in the ocean and one that landed in the San Bernardino Mountains. And so George Marshall, who was the chief of staff, wrote to FDR and said, this is what happened, and we are setting up an interplanetary phenomenon unit to study this problem. So the, the, uh, the initial process would have started during the war, and that's why when Roswell crashes occurred, why our, our teams were all poised and ready and practiced, and it was no big deal. They'd probably done it several times before. Understandable reasons back 50 years ago for secrecy, of course, would have been A, to win the war with Germany, <laughs> and B, to make sure that we were in charge of the technology for Russia and the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so those, those reasons remain very important and very practical and very real. And even today, I would not want to see Saddam Hussein have this high technology. Uh, he may be even less responsible than the other guys. But, um, and so to some extent, protecting this technology from irresponsible people is, is still a useful thing to do. The, the, and, and that's one of the problems where the problem occurs because today as then, in order to keep it away from the bad guys, you have to keep it away from the good guys too. As if you tell the public, you have to assume some of the public are bad guys and they'll go off and run with it like some people you know, make explosives and blow up buildings. So the reasons, however, I believe for, or that are different now as to why the secrecy is, is no longer as much of a problem is that several things have changed. One, there is, I believe, no significant religious reason for keeping a secret, and at that time they didn't really know. Uh, when, when the first UFOs crashed, the radio program, The War of the Worlds, was only three or four years old, and people remembered how allegedly the public got all upset because there were Martians landing in their backyard. I don't think that's a problem anymore. Um, the, the problem of politics, I think, is the same. That is, the people who are in power want to stay in power. And unless they see this as an advantage to staying in power, there's, there's no reason for them to do it. But the reason for, I believe, the genuine reason for releasing this information and story to the public is that we're paying for it. I mean, these covert programs have cost the taxpayers a huge percentage, you know, like 10% uh, of our GNP or some, some big number like that. I mean, you hear numbers like 30 to $50 billion, but I don't think that's 10% of the GNP. I'd be inclined to say we've spent more than that. We have not only the, the well-known covert black programs, but we have, I guess, to use uh, Steve Greer's phrase, unacknowledged black programs. So fundamentally, it's wrong to steal money from people in a democracy. I'm often asked, well, what do I think about what's going on today? And I guess my cautious answer to that question is, uh, my son and I study the documents that we can get a hold of. And those documents tend to span the range from 1941 to 1970. And we know what they say, and we think we can prove that they're authentic and genuine and telling the right story. The word is that in 1970 or so, everything went electronic. And that would have been, I think, quite consistent with what I was seeing and what you'd want to do if you had a really secure program to make it go electronic or just have it word of mouth and write almost nothing down on paper for people to leak. And that may be one of the reasons we're not getting leaks today. The source of propulsion was the principal issue that I initially attacked from the point of view of an aerospace company. That is, how do you get there from here? And part of that answer has to do with the, getting the energy to drive the propulsion system, because clearly it's not done by, by throwing little particles out the rear, as, as we generally do. <clears throat> so I have concluded that whatever the source of the propulsion gravity control is, is the same as the source of, to release energy. And once you find one, you'll find the other. And I also think 
you'll probably get a good hint on how psychic things work. So those things are likely to be interconnected at the various deepest level. Now the only, the theory that I'm most familiar with that I feel kind of comfortable with is the zero point fluctuation theories that, that Dr. Putov has studied carefully. I got a call from the Gaithersburg uh, facility saying that they had 10, or, sorry, 12 to 15 UFOs 50 to 100 feet off the ground. So I asked the guy who was on the radio with me, I said, what do they sound like? He took his head mic off, put it out the van window, and the, again, the pulsating sound, except there were more of them. <clears throat> and he was describing them. 